Uh, welcome to the second uh, keynote address of this year's EDIS uh, annual meeting. For those, <coughs> excuse me, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Paul Crumbly, a Dickinson enthusiast and past EDIS president. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, uh, let me remind you to mute your audio during the talk and to post postpone using chat until the question and answer session that follows the talk. This will help ensure that the signal remains strong. Uh, if, you, if your signal begins to fail, you may also want to mute your video. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Eliza Richards. I first met Eliza at the 1996 American Studies Association annual conference in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. That was before she was the Eliza Richards we know today, before she became the acclaimed author of scholarly works that have changed the way we understand our field. She was, even then, impressive. And those who knew her at that early stage of her career already understood that she had a very bright future. Her paper was entitled Unemployed Feelings, Women Poets in the American Marketplace, 1830 to 1850. She was on her way. Eliza is now an English professor in the Department of English and Comparative Literature at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, my alma mater. I'm very pleased that she's there. While at Chapel Hill, Eliza has won numerous awards for teaching and for her work as a graduate and undergraduate mentor. Uh, those of you who have participated in the Dickinson Institute will not be surprised to learn that she has earned this recognition. Now that Eliza is EDIS Vice President, she has made formalizing the Institute an administrative priority that will help establish the Institute as a permanent feature of future annual meetings and international conferences. Eliza's first book, Gender and the Poetics of Reception in Poe's Circle, continues to be essential reading for Poe scholars, gender studies scholars, and anyone interested in knowing about 19th century American poetry. The Dickinson world is still thanking Eliza for Dickinson in context. Her collection of essays that many of us EDIS members contributed to and that thanks to Eliza's editorial skill and command of the field, promises to remain an indispensable scholarly resource for the foreseeable future. Eliza's most recent book, Battle Lines, Poetry and Mass Media in the US Civil War, is a major study of Civil War poetry. Her talk today, Dickinson on Remote Suffering, will, I think, give us a taste of the analysis that she develops in that work. Please join me in silently, uh, but enthusiastically, welcoming Eliza Richards. Thank you so much, Paul. I, uh, you can tell probably from my screen that I'm red. <laughs> <laughs> with embarrassment and with a sense of the failure of my own memory <laughs> because I don't remember our first meeting. I just feel like I've known you forever. So thank you so much. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today um, and to share some of my thoughts, developing thoughts on um, Dickinson and the question of remote suffering. Um, now, of, of course, um, oh, I'm, I'm going to, I'll share my PowerPoint in just a minute. Um, of, of course, um, pain and suffering has been central to Dickinson's studies and critical inquiries um, for as long as people have been interested in Dickinson's poetry. And uh, Suzanne Juhas uh, and uh, Jane Eberwein uh, very eloquently talked about after great pain yesterday. Um, so uh, this is a shared endeavor and um, one that I'm happy to participate in. Um, and my own thinking has evolved over time. Uh, I started working on the 
Civil War book um, way too long ago in 2004 when I received an NEH fellowship. Uh, so it took a very long time to come to press. Um, and over that time, it was precisely the time when the interest in pain and suffering and, and Dickinson's work turned to the question of historical context uh, of war. Um, uh, Cheryl Woloski, of course, was a pioneer in that field and her um, landmark book, A Voice of War, uh, came out much earlier but only in the last 15 years have people, or 20 years, have people been uh, recognizing and taking seriously the idea that Dickinson, and now accepting pretty much, it's pretty much a, a given that um, Dickinson uh, was engaged with uh, one of the most important catastrophic events of her time. Um, and so I, I, over the course of writing this book, I also watched um, an outpouring uh, and participated in an outpouring work on this topic. And um, work has come to seem in some ways as a result of so much great work, uh, perhaps done with, uh, it's time to move on, uh, but also at the same point, just beginning. Um, and I just want to urge people not to move on too quickly, uh, but to ponder uh, what we've learned uh, about Dickinson and the Civil War and to parse it more carefully and more precisely. Uh, and that's what I want to do today. Um, I'm going back to some of the ideas that I've had for a very long time um, and have been mulling over for a very long time and distilling in some ways and changing in others. Uh, and I want to share that long process of thinking with you today, perhaps um, as a model for dwelling uh, when our profession often moves on too quickly from important topics um, and important discoveries. Uh, so today I'd like to talk about specifically, and this has to do, and now it's probably time to share my screen. One moment, please. Um, Are you seeing my presentation? My, Jane, could you nod if you're seeing my PowerPoint? Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so I realized already that my topic, my uh, title is a bit off as I've been thinking more about the paper, um, that it's really a problem of remote suffering that I'd like to talk about. Um, uh, and that's why I've been mulling over it for so long. Um, and it's a, it's a complex, there's, it's actually a complex array of problems for Dickinson and for the reader of Dickinson's poetry and actually for any student of the Civil War. But what I particularly like to focus on today is the question of how to think and what to feel about, and how to feel, uh, how to even make oneself feel about the suffering of others at a distance. Uh, and this, of course, is quite crucial today when we're overwhelmed. Uh, and we've heard, we heard a great panel on catastrophe in Dickinson earlier, when we're overwhelmed by the way catastrophe is brought close to us via mass media. And that's my topic in the book that, I, uh, that just was recently published. And I'm not in advancing, my screen is not advancing. There we go. Um, Poet, uh, battle lines, poetry, and mass media in the US Civil War, and the question of how to apprehend suffering at a distance when it's brought close via mass media forms, um, something I called mediated immediacy, and I'm sure I'm not the only one to say this. Um, it's the topic of the book, and suffering is, is often at the center of the discussion. And Dickinson, um, appears throughout the book. It's not author-centered, it's network-centered, event-centered, because I'm interested in how events impact poetic trope, poetic language, poetic practice, um, and the history of poetry in the United States. So um, I treat a range of authors in a kind of network way. Um, but Dickinson is there in a number of chapters. Um, so, uh, so what I'm most interested in is the specific question of mass suffering uh, 
not individual suffering, the mass suffering that happens at a distance. Um, and uh, Dickinson focuses quite clearly on this topic in a range of poems that have been discussed. And I will discuss some of the most um, frequently identified, uh, poems identified as the as Civil War poems. So that they will be familiar to you um, if you have read about Dickinson and the Civil War. Um, they should all be familiar to you. Um, so um, I just want to show you, well, maybe I'll say first um, that, uh, and I hope I have time to move through this. I'm trying to, it's hard to juggle the question of time, my presentation in the PowerPoint. I'm not sure how to do all this. Um, so at the same time. So um, what I want to say basically is that pain and suffering are, off, are often um, discussed in terms of Dickinson's own experience. And it's indeed, it's very hard to imagine that she could have such a profound sense and such an articulate way of um, addressing the question of pain um, bodily and uh, the, the intertwined bodily and emotional experience of pain if she herself did not have such pain. And Michael Snedeker has written about this recently in a, in a, in a very eloquent way, um, but many others have discussed this. Um, but the question of the pain of others and how to approach the pain of others um, is, uh, is another topic that is less, um, is less discussed in Dickinson. And that's what I want to focus on today. Um, and, but always, even in the work, Wolosky's work, Chris Miller's work, Faith Barrett's work, other people have worked on uh, the Civil War poems. Um, it's always a question, what is the relationship between the personal and the public, the private and the public, um, personal, Dickinson's own personal experience and how she reaches out to understand others in the world. Um, where, uh, what is the formulation that brings her own experience in relation to the experience of others in the world? Um, so th that's a big question in this, in this talk. Uh, so I wanna say that uh, in the Civil War, as, as, I, as I noted, media is suddenly foregrounded. Um, 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 newspapers, illustrated newspapers, magazines and photography um, them, uh, were constantly bombarding people on the northern home front with images of suffering, uh, spe especially the suffering of white soldiers. Uh, and the question of uh, the suffering of slaves and slaved persons is another issue uh, that I hope I um, can have time to address at the end of this talk. But given how time flies, I, I may not reach that, that topic. Um, but it's um, completely intertwined with the question of the suffering of, of white soldiers and how Dickinson addresses that, which I think that that's a topic for her, the question of uh, suffering white soldiers. So uh, here you see that news is news. That's <laughs> the news itself is news. Uh, and that's a sense of how important uh, the mediation of events is. Um, in this time period. You see crowds of people just clamoring for more news. And, uh, that's ex it's just an extreme experience at the time. And images of mass death, um, photographic images of mass death, of course, reached broad audiences um, through woodcut, uh, present, woodcut illustrations in newspapers and magazines, even if the photographs of the battlefield were only available to smaller groups of people. So photographic, realistic uh, representations of mass death um, were available to Dickinson. And Dickinson herself comments on the, this strange experience of suffering at a distance mediated by newspapers in this, um, maybe in, this, in these lines, um, how news must feel when traveling if news have any heart, a lighting on the dwelling um, twill enter like a dart. And I'm most interested in, forgive the spacing issues, um, advancing on the transport twill riddle like a shot are it's the alternative two lines of the end of this, um, of this utterance. Um, so uh, you see that she's um, concerned with the problem of embodiment, um, of uh, the speaker, 
um, of what the relationship is between uh, this, mm, the agent um, of delivering suffering and um, the way someone is supposed to feel about this. Uh, and uh, she takes a sort of clinical approach, and that's something that I want to look at here, the clinical approach to suffering um, that posits a difficulty in, um, in being able to um, apprehend mass suffering at a distance. Um, so there's no, there's no clear embodied speaker here. Um, it, it's, um, it's the news that's the agent here, and we don't even know who is suffering. There's just an imagined person, people who are suffering actually en masse from delivery of the news. Um, Dickinson shows she's interested in this, and this is a much, quote, much quoted uh, letter uh, in relation to the war, when she clearly says that the idea of suffering has changed during the war for her, um, because sorrow seems more general than it did. Um, rather than the estate of a few persons, um, and that suffering of others might assuage one's own, um, uh, but, but, it, but it doesn't. Um, and um, a piece that's not brought out very often is it's dangerous to value for only the precious can alarm. So that, that foregrounds the problem that we care about those we know and love, but how are we supposed to care about those who are not precious to us. Um, and th that is a topic for her, I, I'm claiming, and one that hasn't been explored sufficiently. Um, so I, uh, I wanted to talk about, and I, 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 I don't wanna take up too much time because I want there to be time for questions, but I wanted to talk about, um, I'm drawing on um, Luke Boltansky's work, uh, Dis Distant Suffering, uh, morality, media, and politics, um, but I won't be able to map out what he's saying, but basically he, following Hannah Arendt, make a distinction between compassion, which you can feel when someone is present and individualized, um, and pity, which, is, which develops when you are observing suffering at a distance. And pity is something that generates literature and language because something needs to bridge the gap of distance. So I think Dickinson is interested in this. And yet pity, um, uh, pity doesn't uh, do the trick quite often. Um, it, it, it poses the question of spectatorship, of um, being vicar enjoying yourself vicariously um, when you're watching the suffering of others, of feeling things but not doing anything about it, um, not, not moving to help the people that you are witnessing suffering. Um, and I think this is an issue for Dickinson and for everybody, uh, Northerners in, in particular during the war because the war was fought largely on Southern soil. Um, so people were aware of the distance, the home front was aware of the distance they were experiencing. So I have to cut, um, but I want to say that the problems are, uh, just reiterate, the problems Dickinson confronts are the impossibility of imagining the mass, the problem of dis differentiating when so many people are dying, uh, 750,000 people, it was, it's been estimated recently have died in the war. Um, uh, and so th there needs to be kind of statistical form of thinking as James does notes. Um, and following that, there's the difficulty of summoning, caring, or even feeling something about this, even though you feel as if you should feel, and you feel as if you should do something. Um, Dickinson's, the evidence of this, the evidence that she's um, grappling with these issues uh, are, are, are notable in a number of ways in these poems I'm just going to run through very quickly to show you. One is the voice, what I call the voicelessness of the speaker. There is no clear I in many of these poems. And we were talking about this yesterday with after great pain of formal feeling comes. If these are individual private experiences of pain, um, why is there no speaker? Um, and so um, the lack of, a, of an embodied speaker means there's a lack of a somatic location for uh, identification, uh, for sympathy, for suffering. 
So Dickinson removes the body of the speaker and she removes the eye of the speaker from some of these poems. And I think it's absolutely fascinating that she does this. Um, a second thing she does is unground the figures. Um, there's no location. There was some discussion of abstraction yesterday, uh, though um, she talks about a pointed ground um, in a, a sunset poem that I'll show you briefly. Um, she's not locating her war poems at specific battle sites. You have to um, generate an argument to say that a poem is about Antietam. Um, she rarely mentions place names or discusses particularities. So there's an abstraction that's extreme. Um, there's also a telescoped perspective that suggests a kind of cosmic enormity of the conflict, but at the same time, a sort of indifference. Um, so those are some of the things that she does. And I'll just briefly show you these and then I'll conclude and I can talk more in question and answer. So here in the name, you'll notice there is no speaker and this is one of her most famous poems. And I started thinking more about this when Chris Miller uh, and I were talking about this poem and she said she couldn't take it seriously. I don't know if you remember this, if you're there, Chris, but um, because it seemed almost grotesquely comic to her. And I think there is this problem of tone in these poems. Um, the name of it is Autumn, the hue of it is blood, an artery upon the hill, a vein along the road. So there's a kind of um, a sense of a flayed body, only blood, no bones, um, that's extreme and grotesque. Um, but it then eddies like a rose away. Oh, I'm sorry. I, my elbow hit the... <laughs> Um, there we go. Uh, uh, my elbow hit my <laughs> keyboard. Um, so uh, there's a grotesqueness which, which gives a sense of forced attempt to bring something home that's only sprinkling bonnets. It's really not doing a lot to affect anybody. Um, and even for the person, not the person who's speaking, it, I don't even get a sense that there's a person here necessarily. Um, there is no I, but the image becomes aesthetic in the last two, uh, purely aesthetic in the last two lines. Um, the blood eddies like a rose away upon vermilion wheels. So uh, that gives me a sense of her giving up in terms of trying to do something to make herself or others um, feel uh, something about this mass suffering. Here, um, she takes up specifically in whole gulfs of red and fleets of red and crews of solid blood did place about the West tonight as twere specific ground. Um, here she makes, uh, she makes suffering a spectacle. She uses dra uh, dramatic um, figures in the second stanza. They disappear. Um, they're due promptly as a drama that bows and disappears. So she's suggesting that someone or something, <laughs> that the, a naval battle is taking place in the sunset sky. Uh, that some, someone view it, let's just say someone viewing the sunset is imagining, um, sorry, is imagining the um, suffering uh, of a naval battle. But even that is to locate the perspective. Um, so it, there's a kind of image of a, a lovely sunset turned grotesque through the battle, the figurative battle language um, that once again does nothing really, um, though she is foregrounding that n nothing is, is done. Um, I'm looking at the time, okay, just a couple more minutes. Um, and I'm sorry, I have to move through these. I'm just basically gesturing toward what I'm thinking about. And I hope that it's enough to show you uh, the richness of what, what I think is the richness of this topic. Here, another very uh, well-known uh, Civil War poem that people tend to think is um, a straightforward sentimental sentimentalization of a situation. It does not strike me that way at all. And I can, I can say more about why, but this is an example of telescoped experience where there's mass death uh, viewed in a highly aestheticized way. 
Um, they dropped like flakes, they dropped like stars, like petals from a rose, when suddenly across the June a wind with fingers goes. Um, and people say the final lines are, critics have tended to say that the final lines are comforting. God can summon every face on his repeal list. list. But there are a number of reasons why I don't think that's the case. Um, it seems almost like a cap at the end of a poem that's too unsettling to resolve that way. Also the idea that um, God would summon the dead. Um, we could get into the theodicy, but that's not my perspective here. What, I, what I'm interested in is the way she renders sinister these beautiful images um, through the, the, the idea of gravity and heaviness, the uh, flakes um, drop perhaps, but stars don't drop. Um, <laughs> unless there's something kind of catastrophic, catastrophic, uh, a galactic catastrophic experience or something like that. Um, and gravity is not working properly there. Um, and then um, petals from a rose um, wouldn't drop if there were a wind. So there are things that are um, unsettling in the beauty of those lines. Also, these are persons, people that she's discussing, uh, and she's figured them, uh, but in a way that personifies the images, but doesn't, and rather than humanizing the people. And you see that quite often. Uh, in her in her poems. Now, I just want to mention this final poem, um, which is uh, I find in many ways <laughs> I have to say repulsive, um, and I'm not sure once again because there's no clear speaker whether she is foregrounding that as something for us to think of morally or whether she is complicit with this. Um, and there has been discussion quite a bit of discussion and a great essay by Erica Fretwell. And I began to talk about this poem and others earlier, the figure of the Blackberry as an African-American slave um, uh, in, in Dickinson's work. Uh, and I think here she's, she's thinking about uh, African enslaved suffering, African-American suffering, but she's using the figure of an edible botanical fruit. <laughs> Uh, the blackberry wears a thorn in his side, but no man heard him cry. He offers his berry just the same to partridge and to boy. So this is an extreme rendering of dehumanization that isn't um, resolved by the end. The, the, the berry is not transformed into a person through pity. Um, instead, you would expect um, something like brave black man uh, maybe through the transformation, but instead you get brave black berry, um, which is bizarre, just simply bizarre. And, and this poem brings up for me this image um, that's very, very popular in Dickens' time as an abolitionist image of, of black suffering. So what I just want to say with this is that um, suffering is raced clearly in the Civil War and uh, suffering is differentiated in various ways within Dickens's poetry. And so we need to spend, attend more to these limitations and, ex and explorations and modes of suffering, um, uh, self and other, uh, than we have as up, till, up till now. And uh, I'll, I'll stop with that um, and thank you all for, for listening. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Eliza. That was wonderful. Uh, we have time uh, for questions. Let me see if I can see if uh, there are any hands. Um, shall I stop the sharing or should I keep that? I guess I'll keep it in case. Um, I'd like to see you all, but I'll keep it up in case someone wants to ask a question about a particular poem. Any, I'm looking, I uh, don't see. Um, uh, Paul, does anyone have any questions? questions? Would you like to put your hand up in the uh, Chris, participants? I have a question. Chris, you're muted. Who has a question? Chris, Chris Miller. Okay, sure. 
Um, thank you, Eliza. That was um, that was really uh, quite wonderful, very provocative, um, and uh, very far-reaching in uh, the generalizations that you're. Um, so, do you have uh, speculation about why Dickinson is writing so many of these poems about? Um, that could be understand uh, understood uh, as being about a, a, a widespread experience of pain, not necessarily a personal experience of pain, as uh, presented in a way that is disembodied, disembodied and ungrounded, and that so mixes this tone of, as you say, really grotesque. Um, uh, bloodiness or suffering and aestheticization at the same time. By the way, I do take um, the name of it as autumn seriously, but the, the tone of that poem I find just wildly divergent between the first stanza and the um, second two stanzas, as you point out. So why why do you think she might be doing this? Yes, uh, I've... <laughs> You're hitting the, the edge of my thinking here, and that's the thing has propelled me to dwell on this forever. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, because I, I constantly shift uh, in terms of, and I'm not sure she pins it down. In, in one way, it's an incredibly courageous thing to reveal a, a sort of lack of caring um, and make it explicit and foregrounded, since sympathy and pity are so incredibly important during the war. Um, she's not alone in this. I wrote, um, I wrote a paper about women poets and the aestheticization of violence in the Civil War. Uh, Sarah Piott, Rose Terry Cook, others I, I know you're familiar with, are also doing this. And I had an unsatisfying answer in that essay as well, why these women are combining the grotesque uh, qualities, uh, why they're figuring war in grotesque ways that also seem to give pleasure um, and also seem to provide them with an impetus to poetic creation, which Dickinson says she sang off charnel steps and she feels power now. Um, so it's a complicated question. I'm, I'm not sure if she is exposing it or complicitous in it, or exposing her complicity without apologizing for it. Um, there, there are all kinds of, I like to pursue these ideas further because I think they're important and um, I'm not sure I would reach a single conclusion on that. Okay, I see that uh, Emily uh, has a question. Emily? I do. Um, and I've also typed this into the uh, chat box. Anne Flick, who did presentations on Dickinson's Civil War poetry in, uh, for some of the NEH workshops at the museum, uh, uh, cited several of the poems that you've cited today, including They Dropped Like Flakes. And in Talking about they drop like flakes, uh, she stated that there are echoes of news reports of battles and bodies on the battlefield um, that show up in that poem and in certain other poems, including the name of it is Autumn. Um, yes. And uh, she had found some parallels between those news reports and yes. the um, and the um, language of Dickinson's poems. I was wondering if you also found some of those parallels. Yes, um, and it's, you know, you can become so fascinated with this that you go down a rabbit hole. But, um, and Chris talks about this in her um, reading in Time. Uh, and I certainly have, have talked about this in, in the published work on Dickinson and the War that yeah. preceded the book, uh, much of which, some of which did not get into the book or got in in a revised form. But throughout uh, the book, I'm, I'm fascinated with the way um, journalistic discourse, news discourse uh, is poetic on the one hand. So they are, it's not a one-way street. They are drawing on uh, romantic 
a poetic figuration in order to fathom uh, mass violence uh, that they have not previously witnessed. Um, so sometimes it seems poetic and then poets import it. <laughs> and so there's this really interesting networked cycle, which is part of what I explore in, in, in the book, both with Dickinson, with Melville. I, I, it's, it's really extreme the way Melville does it in, in a very self-aware way and, and others. Okay, I think Vivian has a question. I do. Uh, first, I'm. I'm. It was just wonderful. I mean, so stimulating, so learned, so rich. So you know, first of all, thank you. Um, I. I don't think I can offer a fully formulated question, but I can offer uh, hints at what the what the formulated question might be um you you refer to poems in which there's no clearly embodied speaker now when you were first discussing this um i think there was an even more extreme version of a claim that led me to wonder how much do you need the speaker to be using the first person pronoun, uh, you know, for you to feel there's an embodied speaker. So um, I, I guess I'm asking, don't you feel a personal presence uh, behind poems in which, as you describe them, there's no clearly embodied speaker. I'd just like to hear a little more about the distinction between a, a clearly embodied speaker and um, a poem without such a clearly embodied speaker. Um, I love that question, uh, Vivian. That's why I wanted to grab a pen because I don't want to forget it. And um, I hope that we can talk more about this uh, because I, I don't want to speak. I'm, I hope I'm trying not to speak thematically, I guess, uh, just simply because I do mention there is no I because that's that's um, overlooked, I think, quite often that she's she's speaking from a kind of critical distance. And uh, people have talked about her definitional poetry, but it's interesting um, in something like and I would have talked about this if I had more time after I would have come back to after great pain because we were talking about it yesterday. But the question I had for Suzanne and uh, and Jane were, was, uh, we assume that Dickinson is, is experiencing this or that somebody is experiencing it. And that's what the, how the discussion went. Um, and yet uh, there seems to be a kind of clinical distance that could either suggest shock of trauma, which is, you know, that would be a, one way of reading it. Someone that's so dissociated. And I think Snedeker uh, talks about this. Uh, that they they can't recognize their own identity. So there are ways, many ways, to think about the sense of disembodiment as a self evidence of uh, a person, uh, an embodied person. Um, so, but I'm experimenting with the other way of looking at it, and pro and you're absolutely right, exaggerating that because it's not a position that people uh, tend to take. Um, and, and Dickinson has so long been given the, a body um, and a pained body uh, and things have been located within that pained body that I'm interested in uh, defamiliarizing that even hypothetically. I hope that makes some sense. Thank you. Uh. Adalberto has a question. Yes, uh, I, I will drop my question because it was the, pretty much the same from Vivian Pollock. And I, and, I, and I just want to thank you, Lisa Richard, for this beautiful presentation. Thank you, Adalberto. It's good to, to see your face and, and meet you uh, kind of in person <laughs> at a distance. Well, uh, I'd like to mention that uh, Jamie Etfel has a question in the chat. and. Um, I can read it, or Jamie, if you would like to come on and speak it, that would be fine. Oh, hi there. Thank you. Thank you, Eliza, for an excellent uh, presentation. I could listen all day. Um, oh, wait. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 
Um, thank you, Eliza, so much. Um, I'm just thinking a lot about pain and suffering and wanting to hear more about how it differentiates between the mass suffering and the individual suffering, because it seems like many of the techniques you point out could be um, seen in poems that you could argue are maybe more pointedly on individual suffering. So I was wondering if you could talk more about maybe how Dickinson uses the, the techniques in different ways to communicate the mass suffering that you're arguing for. Thank you. Yes, great. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, and I'm mulling over this too, but um, I guess the ways, that the points that I, I identified but didn't have, it, I'm looking for my talk now, which I seem to have curled somewhere. <laughs> Here we go. Um, the, the points, the, um, an example of, of something that I think really speaks to um, mass suffering is it, it drops like flakes. Um, there you see this um, with the flakes, they're an absolutely under differentiated particles, right? I know we say that my students, when we talk about this poem, they say, but every snowflake is different. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yes, it may be true, but when, uh, and for some reason, it's a truism. Um, but when we look at the snowfall, there's no difference between those flakes. Um, the same with petals um, and uh, the same with stars. So um, she's, she's imagining multitudinous things um, from a, a, a cosmic distance. Um, and, and that is not something that I see her do in something like, um, I measure every grief I meet with narrow probing eyes. Um, and that is more embodied, for example, or bereavement in their death to feel whom one has never seen, a vital kinsmanship transport. So there she is, she is imagining a kind of specificity, um, I think, uh, and a body. Um, and then, so, yeah, so the, I think the ungrounded figures, the telescope perspective, and the, perhaps the voicelessness of the speaker, but I'm not sure about that, um, are the beginning of trying to identify some of the qualities that, that um, mark poems as interested in specifically the problem of recognizing mass suffering. I, I hope that begins to answer the question. But I want to say the blackberry wears a thorn in his side. The problem is uh, that is a mass figure, I think. Um, but it's an individualized mass figure. Um, it's an absolute convention uh, of an individual suffering person who's not a person, but a, a berry. I think uh, we, we're running a little beyond our official time, but uh, other discussions have run a little bit over time too. So maybe we could take a couple more questions. Uh, whoever is attached to uh, programs of the ARC uh, has a question. <laughs> hi, hi, that's me, Cynthia. It wouldn't let me change my name. Um, so I just had a quick question. Thank you so much, Eliza. I was wondering if you thought that distant disembodied perspective might be a critique of God, given that she considered God an eclipse. A critique of God. Is that the question? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and can you, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question so I, sure, I get it sure. more specifically? Uh, sure, that, that her poems where she's taking a disembodied distant view um, if that isn't maybe a God's eye view, yes. and given that she considered God an eclipse. Yes. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, and, and once again, I, I kind of avoid the, um, the I, don't avo I don't mean to say avoid, but in order not to slip into the incredibly powerful tradition of um, theological readings of Dickinson, I sidestep that question of God and omnip uh, omnipotence because it's just so powerful and um, so present in the poems. Um, so, but yes, especially in They Drop Like Flakes, I think you're absolutely right. She has, she has contempt for um, omnipotence uh, is distinguished from her love of Jesus Christ's suffering. 
for example. So in body suffering. So um, I think that's one thing that I have, one thing that I think is true that I can say about Dickinson's work. So um, yeah, there's kind of anger and rage about that, uh, that omnipotent or um, objective or impersonal viewpoint. Um, and so it is all the more strange that she takes that on in these ways where it doesn't seem to be condemned. Um, so God is condemned, I think. If for, in my reading of It Drops Like Flakes, God is condemned, but there's also a wind with fingers. Um, and there's also this odd perspective uh, that is, th th those are three different things, I think, in the poem. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jeffrey Simons uh, has a question. Yes, just briefly, I too am grateful to Liza for your talk and for all that you've done to to make our the society be what it is today. Just a quick notion as regards what Vivian um, was speaking about. That is, regardless of whether or not there's we find a first person pronoun in the poem, how how do we know whether or not there's an embodied speaker there or a lyric subject? And um, it just occurred to me that you, we might draw on the category of aphorism or aphoristic epigrammatic language. The more aphoristic the language is, sort of the less embodied it seems as the speaker. Or Chris Dan Miller refers to this as terse philosophizing. So the more, the greater the, the percentage of terse philosophizing, the less there is a an individual uh, an individual lyric speaker perhaps that correlation might be drawn. And the other the other things I wanted to just say very quickly is that Jeffrey John, is that in um, a poet's grammar? No, it's in reading in time. Reading in time. Yeah, terse philosophizing. Um, the other thing I just want to say is that Jonathan Culler in his book Theory of the Lyric devotes a lot of pages to the category of what he calls epideictic discourse. That is discourse that is not, it's focused on reality, on the nature of existence. It's not, it's terse philosophizing. That might be a category that you could draw on, that we could draw on. And the, just to conclude, I'm sorry to run on, but you know, you mentioned this. Jeffrey, what that was you, that title? Oh, it's Jonathan Culler, that book oh, Theory Culler, of the okay. Lyric. Yep and the epideictic epideixis as the category. Okay. He, he devotes a lot, he gives a lot of attention import, and importance to that. But you did speak, I, I, mean, I really understood this too clearly about, you know, with the whole gulfs of red and fleets of red and so on, this, this spectacular suffering and so, but that seems to me to be, you know, Dickinson's attempt to try to understand what's going on south of Amherst. Yes, no, I agree. Uh, I, I do agree. There's an attempt to understand uh, it's, what she's doing is very complex, and I think it's tied to uh, news media. Um, I I don't want to be too particular about it, but I, uh, it suggests to me um, the Battle of Mobile Bay um, uh, on the Western, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Alabama with the West, then, and, and uh, that was a very prominent battle. And there's also the, the Mississippi battles. Um, so, um, yes, I, I do think she's trying to figure out um, how to reach out. Um, it, it's, it's akin to her tendency to exoticize that Chris talks about, I think, um, her response. And I'm not saying that she falls short alone. I mean, I think we all have this. Um, it, it's an open question. Um, you know, I buy organic cotton and <laughs> and don't buy plastic and things like this, but, um, you know, and chocolate you eat may come from slave, enslaved labor. So, uh, it, so and, and people say to me, so what that you bought an organic cotton uh, dress? What's that gonna do, you know? So, there's a question, a serious question of what to do uh, in, a, in the era of mass media uh, when we're witnessing, unless you want to give up your life and, uh, and work in a humanitarian capacity. So uh, she's dealing with a very serious question. Okay, there are, there are- I didn't mean to suggest otherwise. There are a couple of other questions at least, but I think we're gonna have to call it uh, to an end. 
uh, without, otherwise we're going to crowd the next uh, event. <clears throat> so thank you again, uh, Eliza. That was wonderful, both in the talk and the responses to questions. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, everybody, for your engaged response. And I'll read the chat. I haven't had a chance to look at it. And uh, don't hesitate to be in touch. Uh, I am thinking about these questions, and um, I, I would welcome hearing from you. So uh, thank you.